Um, would you join me now as we enter into prayer before we open into God's word? Lord, we thank you for this day as always and for your grace and for your love in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would show us today deeper things from your scriptures, that you would open our hearts and our minds to perceive what you have for us, that you would draw us into things eternal and to the deeper life together with you. Bless us, we pray, Lord, as we close this book of Hebrews. We do all this for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13. And this is the last message for this season, at least, on the book of Hebrews. And we're in the very final chapter. We're going to be starting in verse 12. And uh, we want to end the book and end this whole series by asking one big question which is this, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? Moving forward, pressing into life as we go through our daily lives, as we go to work and live together with our families, as we interact with friends and those near us, how then shall we live? We've covered in this series lots of great things. We've gone to the lofty mountains of theology to talk about big things like covenants and the priesthood and the deep movements of God. We've talked about very concrete encouragements that he offers us. It's been a book that has been meeting people that, whether now or back when the book was written, folks who have really been struggling with how to live life as a Christian in a challenging environment, and it's brought encouragement and some challenges And the question at the end of it, as we walk away from this book, is how then shall we live? And I want to uh, say, I want to say that this passage is going to focus in on, this message is going to focus in on verse 14 as the answer to that question, how then shall we live? And it says this, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And the reference that's implied here is a word that's used all through the New Testament, and it's the term resident alien. By him saying, here we have no lasting city, we seek the city that is to come, he's implying that we are here as resident aliens. And the term resident alien immediately draws us into a very deep tension. Because we're at once residents, we're here for a long time, we're not going anywhere, But we're also resident aliens. Our citizenship and our hearts are somewhere else. And it's the kind of tension that the scriptures draw us into regularly, where if you try to draw with, uh, if you try to um, resolve it too far to one side or the other, if you try to rest on one pole or the other pole, it will actually lead you down a path away from what God intends. He wants us to live in this tension of what he says being a resident alien. And the scriptures are full of these tensions, the already not yet presence of his kingdom, to be in the world but not of the world, to seek compassion but also wise justice, to be innocent as as doves and shrewd as serpents. And many of you probably know the Francis Scott Fitzgerald uh, quote which says, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless, yet be determined to make them otherwise. So in other words, the scriptures often call us into having a first-rate spiritual intelligence, which is very challenging. We're called to live into a tension. It's not comfortable. It's easier to be on the poles, but God calls us into a tension of living. You know, I remember um, being at a, a camp one time, and they had a talent show. And there was an eighth grader that got up on stage, an eighth grader of all people, got up on stage and did a little comedy routine. And his whole routine uh, centered around this one thought. He said, he sort of had this dry, sort of slow way of talking. He said, you know, he just walked on sort of like this. And he says, you know, that's how he's opened. You know, I don't want to go into politics because no matter what you do, people hate you. Even with the simple things like buying a tomato. You go, for instance, into a grocery store and you go for an organic tomato and half the country starts yelling at you saying, you hippie, you hippie weakling, why do you have to eat organic food? What's wrong with the food your parents ate? Are you too good for your parents? 
And you say, okay, maybe I won't eat organic tomatoes. So you go for a non-organic tomato. And then the other half of the country starts yelling at you and say, you Monsanto-supporting bioterrorist, how could you eat non-organic tomatoes? So you say, okay, no tomatoes. And then the farmers union starts yelling at you, you're not an American. You don't support our people. It was a hilarious uh, routine there. <laughs> he did it better than I did. Oh, Sarah was there and she said he did. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> awesome. When you have your wife in the crowd. You get the point. Often in life, we're drawn into attention to live in the middle. And that's really what the scriptures call us into as resident aliens, to be fully present, fully loving, fully caring for the world around us, and yet having our hearts, our minds, and our souls set on a city that is to come. And this is what the author calls us into, to embrace this tension as resident aliens. And the way he describes it in these obscure verses is that he makes a reference to two cities. And so in a sense, you could say it's like a tale of two cities. And he's referencing a, uh, a thought that comes up all through the Old Testament and in Revelation where there's this contrast between the city of Jerusalem, the ideal city of Jerusalem, and the city of Babylon. And just like the Jews in the Old Testament that were in exile, our bodies may be in Babylon but our hearts and our citizenship remains in Jerusalem. So again, if you have your scriptures, we'll jump in here to Hebrews chapter 13 and take a look more deeply at what he means by that. Now, there was a, a biblical commentator named Craig Kester who broke down the book of Hebrews into three sections. He says chapters 1 through 4 are really a journey with Jesus the prophet into the true rest of God. And then chapters 5 through 10 are a journey with Jesus, who is the true priest, into the real and life-giving presence with God. And finally, these chapters 10 through 13 are a journey with Jesus, the King, into the true city of God. And if you flip back to chapter 11, you don't all have to do that, but if you flip back to chapter 11, there's two references. It's in verse 10, it says, of Abraham, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder was God. And then later in verse 16, it says, but as it is, they desire, he's talking about faithful, faithful people who walked with God, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And then in our verse, for we here have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Now, if we transport ourselves back to ancient times, so the time of the Romans and even probably more poignantly in the times of the Old Testament, the concept of city, if you just said, I'm going to a city, it would have carried a very special significance that we might not grasp in our current culture today. Because the city was the center of culture. It was the center of society and civilization. If you're outside the city walls, and you'll read references about this all through the scriptures, it is fraught with dangers. There's wild animals and bandits. And in fact, if you go into the Old Testament law, there's even special laws about what to do when you're attacked, when you're out of the city, because it was assumed that people would often get attacked outside of cities. It was a very unsafe place. And so if you lived outside of a city, all you focused on was surviving, growing food, taking care of your animals, and making sure an animal or a bandit or an enemy or a neighbor did not attack you and kill you. That was life outside of the cities. But inside of the cities, where they had walls and they had guards defending the walls, there was enough time to sit and to relax a little bit and to say, you know, I'm safe. And because I'm safe, I can start to focus on higher order things. And so at the center of cities, you'd have uh, things like markets and economies and learning and education. And eventually, in the best cities, you'd have arts and flourishing and philosophy. And so the cities were sort of meant to be the pinnacle of what society was going to, and culture would develop in there. Now, if you scan, if you want to scan through the scriptures and you look to the Old Testament references to what Jerusalem was supposed to be, and then in the book of Revelation, you'll see this, again, this constant comparison between the ultimate city, Jerusalem, and the ultimate city, Babylon. 
Now, Babylon was representative of the highest and best that man could achieve. The highest and best that man could build according to his own abilities. And yet Babylon was a place that was unchecked by ethics or virtue. It was a place that was unguided by deeper eternal purposes. That was what Babylon was. And Babylon in the scriptures was actually a very impressive place. It was a place filled with riches and learning and culture. But if you read through the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation, it was also a place that was filled with greed. The prevailing attitude in the city of Babylon is that it was built on a zero-sum game, which is in order for me to gain, somebody else has to lose. Or in order for one group of people to gain, another group of people has to lose. And Babylon was a city whose culture and riches were maintained by ruthless power over others. And indeed, as we look around the world today, in many ways, the scriptures tell us that we live in modern-day Babylon, in a sense. We see around us the spirit of Babylon all around the world. So there's lots of advancements in culture. There's lots of developments in science and in the arts. But we also see uh, the world that's often surrounded by unchecked greed, where there's an accumulation of resources with a certain amount of people. We see a vying for power amongst different groups of people based on a narrative that one group only benefits when another group loses. You might hear this often, or at least see this under the surface of a lot of different conversations. And really the predominant philosophical underpinning of a lot of Babylon here in the West come from people like Marcuse and Foucault, whose whole premise was the gaining of power. And so in some of the more incendiary movements that are framed in terms of justice speech, more of them underneath them really are movements to gain power. And that's because we live as residents of Babylon. We are in the world. We are in Babylon, the best that man can create. Now, when you read back through the scriptures and you look at the description of Jerusalem, on the other hand, we see it's what Abraham sought after. It says Abraham was looking forward to the city that has its foundations whose designer and builder was God. So in comparison to Babylon, that's built with the highest and best intentions of humans. Jerusalem was built and designed by God. And so it's not based on greed or power. It's not based on a zero-sum game where in order for one group to gain, the other group has to lose. But it's a city, it's ultimately a culture and a center of life that's built around the goodness of God, around the love of God, and around the justice and perfect wisdom of God. And just for fun, I know all of you will do this this week during Thanksgiving, if you want to open Revelation chapter 22 and 23, as one often does during Thanksgiving, it gives us this amazing image of the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that is to come. Again, being the center of society and culture of the whole new heaven and new earth. It's a place where there's no disease or death, where all poverty, all strife, all racism, all injustice has been wiped away. All tears are removed and death no longer has any sting. It's a, repl- it's a place that relies completely on the abundance of God that doesn't even need the sun, a burning thing of gas, because the light of God is unending and eternal. It's a place where people can receive from him. And because God is a well of eternal goodness, somebody else doesn't have to lose in order for somebody else to gain because it all comes freely from the generosity of God. This is the image that it gives us. It's a city that's designed for life to flourish because God is at the center. And all of life is oriented around his perfect will and his plans for the world. And what this chapter tells us here at the end of this book, written to a group of people who are struggling living in Babylon, it says, for here we have no lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. And that brings us back to our question for today. How then shall we live in light of this? Jesse, that's great. A lot of great trivia through the Bible about Babylon and Jerusalem. How then shall we live? And again, looking back at this passage, which is a conclusion to this big book and sermon, I want to quickly consider with you three things, three things that we can take to heart and grab a hold of as we ask, answer that question, how then shall we live? 
That first comes from the main verse here, 14 today, which says, seek the city that is to come. And what he's saying there is, is if we, again, if we can grab this image that we're going to all read over the Thanksgiving from Revelation 22 and 23, what he's saying there, all this that we talked about of Revelation 22 and 23, that is part of the character of what happens when God's presence is in a place. Jerusalem in Revelation 20, 20, 22 and 23 is what happens when God's presence is in a place. And so when Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means the Jesus that rules in that new Jerusalem is the same Jesus that's ruling in our hearts now. That all that we can expect of Jesus to rule in an unbridled way in the new Jerusalem is present in our hearts now if we allow him to have his way in our lives. So the abundance and the peace and the joy and the goodness and the generosity that's present of what we look forward to in the new heaven and new earth is present within us now by the presence of God himself. The same one that will rule that new Jerusalem is ruling here and now in our hearts and in this church. And so when the author says, seek the city that is to come, what he's saying is turn to Jesus and turn to the culture and the life that Jesus will build in that city. That despite all of Babylon around us, despite the zero-sum game that we see in conversations where people are pitted against each other, that we don't fall for that zero-sum game, that we don't fall for this power struggle and wonder who's going to win. We know who's going to win. God is going to create new heaven and new earth. So we don't have to worry or fret. We can live with peace and justice and generosity because we are tapped into the source of peace and justice and love and generosity in the person of Jesus Christ who dwells within us. So when he says, seek the city that is to come, it's a call to us to inner formation, to turn our hearts and our minds to what our future reality will be that's present here with us now in Jesus Christ. Seek that city that is to come. To allow Jesus to take more and more residence within our hearts. To continue to take root and to bear out fruit in our lives. So some really quick practical pastoral questions for us. Do we spend more time discussing, worrying about, looking at, reading the news and social media? Or do we spend more time in the presence, in the words, and in prayer with the leader of this new Jerusalem? Are decisions defined more by the parameters of Babylon? Again, zero-sum game, greed, I got to win, you got to lose. Or are they built around the virtues of this new Jerusalem that are present to us in Jesus Christ? Is what we worship truly, and by worship I mean give our lives to really, if we ask the question what we're giving our lives to, is what we worship more representative of Babylon or is it in Jerusalem? We live in Babylon for now and for a while, but the encouragement here is to seek the city that is to come. And the way we do this is by time with God personally, time with his people in worship together, what we're doing here now, and time together living for him out in the community. Seek the city that is to come. That's our first encouragement. Secondly, from our gospel reading today, which Stephen read uh, from the middle of the congregation, Jesus says this in Matthew 5. He says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Interesting that Jesus uses the word city to describe us and calls us a city. Hmm. <laughs> Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus tells us that when we take on the nature of that future city, New Jerusalem, when the culture of that New Jerusalem and the values and the virtues given to us by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, when those take root in our lives, that we will look at the world around us and that we will have love for the world around us. And what he encourages us to do is that as the, the, the leader of that new Jerusalem takes residence in our hearts, our hearts naturally will love the world around us and we will, as he says, shine our light out into the darkness. And so the reason that we do WizKids, which is a great ministry here where we 
care for kids in an elementary school and help them to catch up with reading and math. And the reason we're going to announce a blanket drive in a few minutes. And the reason that we love our neighbors and welcome people into this church and open up our homes for dinners with people that we don't know is because we're sitting, seeking a city that is to come. And we become ourselves a city on a hill that shines its light out into the world for it to see. So we are a city on a hill. That's the second encouragement, that we live for that. And this last one, I'll just close here. Is that we're be like Jesus, and we get these from these verses, that we be like Jesus in loving a city that will never love us back. Our passage today, back if you go to chapter 13, verse 12, it says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. And that reference there, outside the gate, refers to how Jesus went into Jerusalem. And when he went into Jerusalem, the Gospels say that there's this really interesting scene where he's standing sort of looking at the city of Jerusalem and Jesus lets out this mourn. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, the city that killed the prophets. If only you had heeded my word, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers the chickens under her wings. And I would have you come to me. And Jesus looks at Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, do you know what you were designed to be? And yet you look so much more like Babylon than what Jerusalem is supposed to be. And if you would just heed my words and walk into my kingdom, then you will become the ultimate Jerusalem that I want you to be. And so he went into Jerusalem with this message. And what happened? He was rejected. He was despised. And ultimately, he was taken out of the city of Jerusalem to be crucified. And what did Jesus do at that moment? What did he do? He loved Jerusalem anyways. There's that phrase here in verse 12. It says that Jesus was taken out of the city and sacrificed in order to sanctify the people by his blood. So even in being rejected and taking out, taking, taken out of the city of Jerusalem himself, he did so in suffering and dying on the cross in order to love the city of Jerusalem and all those that rejected him anyways. That's why the apostle calls us to go to Jesus, verse 13, therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. So we're called to this very challenging task to embrace this tension of being resident aliens. We live in Babylon, but our hearts are in Jerusalem. We know that one day we will see the new heaven and new earth as we just sang, but we're here now, and we live in a place with suffering and disease and death, and ultimately we live in a place that will reject the message of Jesus Christ because it's in love with Babylon and all that it can achieve. And the darkness does not like the light shining into it. Yet the scriptures call us to live in this way. And when we are rejected and when we are despised, just as Jesus was, the Hebrews author says, don't despair, but actually go out of the city, verse 13 again, go outside the camp to bear the reproach with Jesus. Go to meet Jesus, the source of light and life and love himself. Don't despair. Go to him who is the source. Jesus knows more than all of us how to love a city that didn't love him back. And we experience rejection or conflict or challenges. The author again says to us, don't despair. Go to him who is the source. Let him be the source of our love and our life and our light. So again, how then shall we live? How then shall we live in light of all this? We shall live as loving resident aliens, shining our light into the world, Leaning in on Jesus, the source of light and life and love. And just to end off our series, I want to point us to verse 20, which I'll just pray, which is the benediction at the end of this book of Hebrews. So if you could just pray together with me. Now may the God of peace, who brought us again from the dead, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.